Dr. Shabir, welcome to Let the Quran Speak. My pleasure to be on. We hear stories of black magic, Dr. Shabir, all around us. Pe a lot of people believe in black magic. So I want to ask, do Muslims believe in black magic? What does the Quran say about that? Yeah, so if we talk about Muslim belief, we'll, we'll, we'll go through a wide spectrum because we have to survey every Muslim okay. and, and we'll see that there's so a variety of attitudes. So maybe we should ask, should attitudes. Muslims believe in <laughs> yeah. black magic? Yeah, well, well, okay, we'll take it a step at a time. So um, the, you asked about the Quran as well, mm -hmm. all right? So uh, the, in, in the Quran, uh, there, there are several mentions of, uh, of, of magic, mm, magic okay. more generally. And, um, you know, when we think of black magic, we think of, uh, you know, something involving evil spirits or the devil. Mm -hmm. uh, so where's the line of distinction between other magic and, and black magic? But uh, in any case, in, in the Quran, um, and there, there are several mentions of, uh, of magic. Usually, m most often, it, it is the, the people who do not believe in the prophets of God who are saying that the prophet of God is doing some kind of magic. Mm -hmm. He's a magician. Uh, yeah. According to the Quran, that seems to be a, uh, accusa an accusation that was leveled uh, against uh, Jesus on whom be peace. Though the reference is not very clear. Were people saying that about Jesus or were they saying it about, about the prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him? Uh, when he came, they said, you know, this is clear magic, sihr uh, mubin, sihr in Arabic, meaning, meaning magic. And uh, we, we know that outside of the Islamic tradition, it is uh, um, mentioned that, that people uh, accused Jesus of being a magician. And on that basis, they led him out to be stoned uh, for what they said were, were his um, practicing of, of magic. Um, in, in, but in the Quran, most often the, those who don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they're saying that the Quran that he's reciting uh, is magic, sihr. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, probably they said that because they could feel that the Quran has a certain pull. It, uh, it, there's a magnetism um, in the Quranic recitation that draws people to it. So maybe they thought that uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is performing some kind of a magic on them. Or maybe them. it has like a supernatural element that they can feel, right? That, yes, so they're referring to it as, as magic. Mm -hmm. um, and, but in the Quran itself, uh, reference is made to uh, magic that was done in the time of Moses on home be peace. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, it is uh, mentioned that, uh, w for example, in the seventh chapter of the Quran, uh, Moses has this confrontation with uh, the magicians because they, when, when Moses comes uh, to the Pharaoh and, and Pharaoh says, okay, so, you know, show me something that would uh, demonstrate that God is with you. So Moses had these signs. He was able to cast his uh, a staff and the staff turns into a serpent. And uh, he, he withdraws his hand from his cloak and his heart, hand is very white. Um, and um, uh, so uh, Pharaoh says, okay, this looks obviously like magic. So I'll get the magicians. It's, uh, you know, he talks to his so, um, um, guides, his, um, those, those who are offering uh, his advisors. Uh, advisors, exactly. And uh, they said, okay, you know, call for the best magicians to come forward uh, for a contest here. Let's see whose magic is superior. Uh, so the um, magicians come and, uh, you know, they go first, they cast their, their staffs. And uh, the, the Quran says in the 116th verse of this seventh surah, saharu nas. They, they, they bewitch the, uh, the eyes of the people mm. uh, uh, and, and cause them to fear. Um, so now Muslim scholars uh, thought about this and, and took different attitudes towards this. Some uh, are, are willing to say that, okay, people can cause the uh, natural order to change with this kind of magic. Uh, some others thought that, uh, no, what they did was not re real. They, um, they, they just bewitched the eyes of the people. So they used some kind of psychological trick. Like an illusion, uh, perhaps. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, something like an illusion. Uh, they they cause the people to think. You, you know, you can work up a crowd and and make the crowd believe that they're going to see something, and then you show them something close to that, and they think they actually saw what you worked them out, what what mm -hmm. you worked them up to, what you prepared them uh, to think that they're going to see. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like so, if you go to a magic show, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the magician is doing all these tricks. But yes. you, I mean, he knows and he will even tell you if you ask. I remember we, we, we went up to a magician and asked, how did you do these things? And 
And he said, they're just illusions, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. Like it's, it, it just kind of like tricks you into believing somehow the way they move their hands, the way they distract you. Um, so, so it, you know, <laughs> yes. you feel that this is real, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. So something like this probably is what the magicians uh, in the court of Pharaoh did. Uh, but uh, the, what, what Musa a.s. did, what Moses did, wasn't magic uh, from the Quranic perspective. This is uh, God's uh, um, intervention mm -hmm. uh, causing his uh, uh, staff to change into a serpent or, you know, his hand to become so glowing white uh, that this clearly is a sign that something supernatural is uh, going on. So th at least this is how the Quran has been generally interpreted. Uh, there may be some people now, some uh, Muslims, who think, well, the, um, the, the scientific order of things is so well in place that we should not, we should give some other interpretation to these passages. But nonetheless, this is the story. This is how it is told in the Quran. And, and that would naturally predispose many Muslims to think that uh, magic can occur. But, but can uh, persons who are not uh, prophets of God uh, perform such tricks, uh, such, such magical feats. Mm -hmm. And uh, th this uh, now becomes uh, an issue for discussion. Some uh, Muslims may think that there are uh, evil forces that are out there, the Satan and his entourage, who can help people to perform such magical feats, which would be called black magic because we're dealing now with evil spirits. And whether or not uh, they do have that power to effect such change in the world, and, and whether people can, with the help of such devils, uh, effect such change and harm other people, uh, this now is, uh, is a question among uh, Muslims. Some will say yes, uh, some will say no. Mm -hmm. Dr. Shabir, there's a story in the Hadith about, about the Prophet Muhammad being um, the victim of black magic. And, and the story goes that he was ill for quite a long time. Um, until I believe some hair was found, and 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 then once that hair was discovered, then he was cured. Yes, yes. Just as we have, like in, in you know, in the understanding of the voodoo tradition, that uh, you know, you you start with some object that is connected to the person, and then uh, you do something to that object, and and that person suffers the harm. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in a similar way, it is thought, according to that hadith, that. Uh, some hair of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was gathered maybe from his comb and uh, tied into a knot and, and placed at the bottom of a well. And that was causing the Prophet, peace be upon him, to be ill uh, until uh, Ali, the cousin of the Prophet, peace be upon him, eventually went and discovered that um, uh, knot and, and untied it. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, now was loosened from his, uh, from his burden. Um, uh, many modern Muslims uh, question this, this narrative because though it is found in, in many of the um, generally reliable classical sources of uh, hadith narratives, uh, they, they find that this is too extraordinary to, um, to give credit to it as if something, it, it actually happened like this. It naturally reflects the beliefs of the people who were compiling these narratives and even those who were trading in them, telling one to, an, to another. But did it actually represent the facts on the ground? Was the Prophet, peace be upon him, bewitched and, and suffering from this um, uh, situation for some time? Uh, many Muslims f uh, feel that you know, God was in, uh, in, in supervision of the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and guiding the Prophet, peace be upon him, closely. Uh, it seems odd that uh, God would allow for something like this to have been uh, happening to the person that he's so closely guiding and supervising. Mm -hmm. And uh, many Muslims think that this narrative, uh, though reflecting the beliefs of some early Muslims, uh, nonetheless uh, does not reflect the actual facts on the ground in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I guess because the Prophet was also receiving revelation, right? He, so he had a very close connection to God and then the sense that like if he was bewitched then how could he tell what was revelation and what wasn't? Yes, so for these reasons many um, would, would, would suspect those hadiths uh, containing uh, not, not uh, narratives that are true to the facts on the ground but, but more reflective of the beliefs of the people who were relating these narratives. 
Now, having said that, speaking about the knot, there is a, uh, the, the one uh, but last chapter of the Quran, mm -hmm. Surah Al-Falaq. Uh, so we should say that's the 113th chapter of the Quran, uh, which teaches us, us to pray for refuge in God from, among uh, other things, النفاثات في العقد. The, those women who used to blow in the knots. Mm -hmm. uh, the commentators say that this ref ref refers to a sort of magical practice where, you know, people were blowing into some knots. And we spoke about the here of the Prophet, peace be upon him, being tied into a knot. Um, as, but but this, this does not mean that it actually is effective, that some mm. people by doing that are able to affect change. But uh, again, the psychological trick can be such that if you think that, that people have that power, uh, then you yourself can feel that you're under such a spell. If you feel that you're under such a spell, that could have a psychological effect on you. And maybe when it comes time to apply for a job, you don't apply because you think, I'm not going to get the job because I'm under this spell that's, that's holding me back and, and causing me to be a failure. So if you have that negative sense that, that something is holding you back, you will be held back. So by giving us this prayer, God is not necessarily telling us that it is true that people can harm you with these things. Uh, but uh, by our, uh, what God is get, giving us is a prayer to get rid of any such effects, even our own harms from our own um, mistaken uh, belief that those things could harm us. Okay. So let's get more direct, Dr. Shabir. Should Muslims believe in black magic and should they fear the consequences of it? Uh, well, you know, just, just to be very complete, I would say that there is uh, in the mention in Surah Al-Baqarah in the second chapter, there in the 102nd verse, uh, there is a mention of uh, devils teaching magic to, to people. So mm. that would be classified as, as black magic. Uh, but then too, um, you know, uh, having come this far, and, and just to wrap it up very quickly here, I would say that despite all of this, uh, it, it does not seem to me that today uh, people have this power to effect change by uh, these magical arts. Um, so it, it is better for Muslims to cultivate a scientific mind. I believe that's the mind that the Quran as a whole is teaching us to cultivate by telling us to think, to travel, to see, to examine, uh, and so on. That's basically a scientific mind. And uh, in the scientific world, we understand that things happen by physical cause and effect. And, uh, you know, it cannot be that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is one in one place, and something is being done to his hair in another place, and he's feeling the effect of it, because there's no physical connection between the two. And this is uh, one of the hallmarks of science. There has to be a physical connection. And the physical does not mean like a solid object. It could be something in the air, could be, but, but things that can be described in physical terms. It's not some kind of supernatural or magical thing that, that is happening between this and, and that. The connection has to be a physical one. If it's electricity, like water can be a conductor of electricity, but there's water there and the electricity is flowing through the water. So there's a physical connection. Um, you know, if it's airwaves, then, you know, there is the air and, and, uh, and, and the waves. So these are all physical things. But to say, no, you know, without any such physical connection between two things, one is affecting the other. Uh, this is unscientific and it's not uh, healthy for Muslims to have that sort of attitude. But of course, we believe that God can do anything. Um, but to now as ascribe all of this kind of power to supernatural forces other than God, um, this seems to go beyond the call of our religion. Thank you for sharing those thoughts, Dr. Shabir. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this video, click like and subscribe. And please donate to support our work at QuranSpeaks.com.